but also institutionally. How do you keep pace with uh, a changing world in the sense of millennials? They learn from their mobile phones to watching uh, videos at any time of the day instead of uh, having the old ways we were teaching in the classroom with fixed schedules. Welcome to another episode of the Mapscaping Podcast. My name is Daniel and this is a podcast for the geospatial community. My guest on the show today is Hans van der Quast. He is a physical geographer and he's also a lecturer in GIS and spatial data management. So we cover a lot of ground in this episode. We start off talking about teaching GIS and geospatial skills online versus teaching them in person in the classroom. And we also talk about well, how can we create a business around that? Is it possible to do this as a business? What would that look like? What is working? What is not working? And so you, you might not be interested in a bunch of those things, but maybe you are interested in communication online. This has become part of our everyday for most of us. So if that's the case, then there is definitely something here for you. Hi Hans, welcome to the podcast. I'm really looking forward to talking with you. And today we're going to be talking about education and GIS and maybe just maybe talking a little bit about business models around education later on during the conversation. But I, I think first, if you could just take the time to introduce yourself to the listeners, please. Sure, great to be here. So I'm a, a physical geographer specialized in GIS and remote sensing. I work at IHC Delft Institute for Water Education, which is the largest international graduate water education facility in the world. We are based in uh, Delft, and uh, in my job as a GIS lecturer, I teach different topics related to uh, water, GIS, remote sensing, and modeling to MSc students from all over the world. What was it about education that you found attractive? So I'm assuming, I, I believe you said that you're a physical geographer. You could have done a lot of other things, but you decided to go into education. What, why was that? I think it's a very nice job to transfer knowledge. And I started already early uh, as a lecturer. Uh, I was an assistant at Utrecht University where I studied and spending a lot of time in the GIS lab. And uh, after graduation, uh, I assisted my own uh, GIS lecturer there. In, that was back in 2002 and developed a curricula based on new materials uh, with, with some new technologies that we learned about, such as uh, stereo photogrammetry, the digital uh, way of processing it. And uh, yeah, it's just very cool to introduce new things in education. So one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is because you, you obviously you have this background in education, but you're also used to educating people online. So you have a lot of in-person skills in terms of educating people in, in GIS and in, in geospatial, but you've also done it online. I, I guess I'm a little bit curious. If you had to choose, would you choose in-person education or would you choose online education? That's always a good question. I think uh, both have advantages and disadvantages and it's very hard to choose. But I think for the GIS courses that I give at the moment that uh, online modality works best. Although when you're in the classroom and uh, you have not a too large uh, group of students, then the interaction can be uh, better and you can uh, watch over their shoulders and you can improvise and do ad hoc, helping them out with their challenges. But if you do it online, you can um, work with larger groups and also the students, they are better capable of finding out things themselves because the threshold is a bit larger to, with every little issue, ask a solution from the lecturer, such as... Uh, downloading and unzipping a file or installing the software. And I did some uh, tests on that uh, during this uh, COVID crisis where we did in between the lockdowns face-to-face uh, -face teaching in the class and uh, we also did parts online. And what I found out that there are much less of these questions asked when you do it online and uh, students are capable of figuring that out themselves using the materials, the videos and uh, the internet. So, so what you're saying is that in absence of the opportunity just to ask a lecturer, they had to find out for themselves and they did. Exactly. And that's also a real world skill that you need. How do you look for solutions with materials that you have? Of course, it's still a course. So you have materials available in a platform. But on the other hand, you also have the internet and there are fora. And we also stimulate to uh, students to ask questions in a forum as if they do that on the internet. And I think it's very important to start very early with teaching those skills. So this is really interesting that you, you brought up the COVID crisis because that forced a lot of us to take our in-person activities and move them online. Is there a direct correlation between what you can do in the classroom, what works in the classroom and what works in an online environment? You can't transfer uh, directly a face-to-face -face classroom course to an online uh, environment. And online is also a bit broader than what many people uh, think about when they hear online teaching. Most people think about uh, streaming your classes to the audience through uh, Zoom or Teams or a big blue button. 
But that's probably the worst you can do. There was a very nice uh, article in the beginning of the COVID crisis about uh, moving from emergency teaching, emergency remote teaching to real online uh, teaching. It was published in EduCause. What we did in the beginning of the COVID crisis was moving all those face-to-face classes to streaming to the students' houses where they are. Yeah, you lose a lot of those advantages that I mentioned in the beginning when you ask the preference between classroom teaching and online because you don't see their body languages. There is, uh, their cameras are switched off. You can't watch over their shoulder what they're doing. So basically you're streaming your lecture to a bunch of zombies on the other side. And also from the perspective of the student, it's not very interesting because there's less interaction. There are all kinds of technical problems that happen. And the first question they ask, and sometimes the only question is, can you record the session? Because then they're sure that when they are not concentrated anymore, that they can binge watch all those lectures later. So I think it's much more important to use a different type of online learning, but also these authors uh, talked about and what I practice is uh, to do a more asynchronous teaching, which means design your online course. Anyways, it should be by design and not by transferring a face-to-face course, but design it in such a way that uh, students are in a kind of flow to uh, work through the materials, but also give them nice ways to uh, get engaged uh, with the, the materials through all kinds of quizzes and interactivity. And uh, in my experience, that works really well. You can add to that, of course, those online live streaming sessions, but then use that only to get real interaction. Go with them through the forum where they have asked questions and discussed that. Do a quiz. I use a lot uh, Kahoot, which is very nice to engage with them. And uh, you see some positive competition uh, between the students. And uh, at the end of the course, they can win a prize. That can be something as little as a a sticker. Uh, But with online, of course, that doesn't work. So we send them. a t-shirt from my uh, Redbubble shop, uh, a GIS design, and uh, that's for the winner in the end. And that always works great to make them learn the theory and to do the quizzes. Could you give me an idea of the breakdown of this kind of online learning? Are we talking about an hour of video and then some quizzes? Are we talking about a, a sort of self-directed, uh, not exam, but like a use case scenario where they have to you know, create a map or do a certain analysis and then back to another video? Like, what would the ideal breakdown be? I think there's no one size fits all, but I think in general, for courses learning the GIS uh, techniques and the good practice, then uh, I normally start with a, a couple of theoretical uh, videos with quizzes that can be short clips of 10 minutes and maybe uh, three of them. And then you go through the steps to perform some uh, actions uh, using the GIS software. In our case, we use QGIS. In the beginning, we also explain the workflow with the flowchart, because that's also an important skill and that they are from the beginning conscious about what the workflow is that they're following to solve a certain uh, problem with GIS. Also, in between the text, there are some check and balance quizzes or questions, for example, to make sure that they use the correct uh, projection or the correct settings. I think that's a very important thing about a self-paced online course, that they have to do a lot of effort to get really lost or get into a wrong junction of your course and end up with the wrong result. So you need to have those checks and balances. In the last uh, chapter, I always include a video that recaps the whole exercise, and they're free to jump to that section to, to correct maybe their uh, challenges that they, uh, they have during the course. Then in the end, they have to uh, submit an assignment, which is uh, a result of that uh, exercise, and that's graded. How do you build in things like uh, accountability into this and something else, which I think you know, obviously have is, is much easier in person, is that sort of group work, so working as a team to solve a problem. Can that be done online as well? It can be done. So there are many, many different formats of uh, doing online activities. What we in uh, university education uh, always try to apply is uh, what we call constructive alignment. So we start with uh, phrasing the learning objectives of the course, and then you need to define uh, the activities. And for online, they can be very different than from uh, classroom teaching. And uh, based on what your objectives are, you can include then certain activities like peer learning in uh, online teaching, where uh, they have to respond to, uh, can be even video clips or statements in a forum, and uh, that you also judge them about how much they interact with each other and respond to each other's uh, remarks or questions. What you can also do is uh, interactive quizzes where uh, as a group they have to respond. If you do live streaming, you can, of course, make uh, breakout rooms. There are some great tools that uh, do that. Probably most people know the breakout rooms from Zoom, but there's also uh, the Wonder platform where you can create bubbles 
in your inside your bubble discuss uh, certain uh, topics and then the teacher can uh, take a plenary to uh, to present certain things or to recap or to have the one of a group presenting the results so the different ways to deal with uh, with group exercises so so you've mentioned this idea before of interactivity in forums where students are together in, in this forum in this online place and they're answering questions and they're engaging with, with, with each other. I imagine it's more difficult to get people to engage in that way online. Is there any sort of uh, tricks to do that or is there anything that, that you find helps to increase students' engagement with the course material and of course with each other? Well, it all starts with intrinsic motivation. So that's something that is very hard to control. Therefore, we need to uh, differentiate between different target groups. So we can have uh, master students and their intrinsic motivation is, of course, uh, led by that they really uh, want to pass uh, and, and get a diploma in the end. So they will do their best to, uh, to work on the assignments and work together and, and fulfill the requirements of the course as much as possible. It's a completely different story if we have uh, professional trainings. There we can distinguish between people that uh, pay by themselves for the course because they are uh, motivated, they want uh, to learn something, they have chosen the topic. Those ones are really uh, eager to, uh, to do all the assignments and to work together and to actively participate. But there's also a category which gets a course from their organization or uh, a course that's organized by donors who selected the participants. And we see there that the uh, engagement rates are much lower. Also, you need to adapt your modalities to these different target groups. So if I have a group of professionals that have to follow a course uh, because their uh, organization chose for it or donors did, then you need to do something what I would call suboptimal, but probably your only choice. And that is to have them in a live session for a couple of hours because they will not do their homework and they will only spend the time uh, allocated for the contact hours. That's uh, different for uh, yeah, people who follow courses by themselves or the MSc students. So I think you, you raise a really interesting point here. And this is like, how, how do we get students to engage with, with the teaching? And of course, one of the things you said was some people are intrinsically motivated. They've paid a lot of money, for example, or they have a very definite goal in mind and, and they're going to get there. And this is part of the thing they need to do to get there. So they're motivated in that way. And I think you, you mentioned this other example where people have perhaps been given this opportunity. and and it sounded like they were less motivated to get to the end. They were less likely to complete the course and you needed a whole other structure for those kind of people. Do, do you ever have the feeling that education should not be free because of this? That it, it, it might actually be a generous thing to do to force people to have skin in the game, to, to pay for their education and, and therefore force them or encourage them or perhaps motivate them to pay attention as well? I think that's a really uh, interesting point. Personally, I think that a little fee uh, helps. It doesn't have to be an expensive course, but a little fee already helps to uh, increase the uh, engagement of the participant. Free choice should always be uh, the case, I think, because that increases the motivation. But we know that if we uh, implement uh, free courses and people can uh, get in the end a certificate if they pass certain automated assignments, and we did this with large groups. So I did a course uh, for UNESCO on uh, programming for geospatial hydrological applications. We had more than 4,000 participants registered. But only uh, 15% had the diploma in the end, the certificate, because they passed uh, the assignments. It's also in your uh, podcast with uh, Don Boy in episode 83 that uh, for his uh, Coursera courses, which were also quite large, there was a, a rate of 10 to 12% of people who complete uh, the course. So we know that these rates can be quite low for uh, free products. Similar statistics uh, uh, I have for uh, people who pay for the course or do a master's, and there, of course, you reach uh, almost 90 to 100%. I think in that episode, Don also made the point that if you buy a book and you only need the first three chapters or chapter one, two, and seven, I mean, that's okay as well. I think that, and, and that's a really important thing to consider when, when we're, we're having this conversation. That's indeed a, a very good point. I think that uh, learners, and we are all learners, we learn. Uh, Lifelong. Lifelong learning is also a concept. And how do we do that? Uh, first of all, we use a lot of resources from the internet. And anything that you need to fix in your house, probably you look up a video on YouTube to, uh, to check how other people do it and then uh, replicate it. That's the same for GIS. There are a lot of nice uh, YouTube channels around where you can learn from others how they solve certain issues. There are also uh, blogs. And you don't necessarily get a certificate from that. That's not the motivation for going to such uh, places to learn. 
And free courses can be a similar kind of uh, resource. So we call these kind of resources open educational resources. If you produce a lot of them, like a lot of uh, YouTube videos and a lot of blogs, then you could also bundle them into courses and mix them for different target groups. What we also do is organize uh, tailor-made trainings where a customer, an organization asks certain uh, objectives from your course, and then you can simply mix what you have, add a few new ones. And uh, the key is that you also keep those uh, available open so people know what you can do. Yeah, so, so let's talk about this, this for a second. So you mentioned a bunch of different online resources you might be creating. So I know that you have a blog and you've written several articles, you have some online courses. Can you sort of describe to me how all of this sort of fits in, in, into a business model or might fit into a business model? What, what is the role of all this free content that you're putting out there? How do you decide which should be free and which should be paid for? That's a bit like uh, how the open source world also uh, works with software. So what I always uh, tell my colleagues is the materials themselves are not the value. It's a value chain where we add value. So the value that is added can be a certificate. It can be an official certification like the QGIS certification that we have, or it can be an um, enthusiastic lecturer that adds experience. It can be the location where you teach in our institute in Delft, for example, where you can meet others from the water sector. So it can be many different things, but it's not the materials as such that have the monetary value where people have to pay for. That's similar with open source software. Uh, the monetary value of QGIS is uh, probably zero, but it has a very high value for everybody involved because there are all kinds of products and services developed around it, from teaching materials to uh, features to, uh, and other things that, uh, that such an ecosystem needs. So learning from that, you can also do that for educational materials. Have your open educational resources available as a, as a business card for people to know uh, what you can do and uh, have them as high quality materials. So don't only post your simple and bad tutorials, but they should also really have high quality and post them on all kinds of uh, social media and uh, people will find you and they will start interacting with you and you get inspired to produce more YouTube videos or you write another blog post, another tutorial. And then... Through time, you have uh, a lot of different materials that you can uh, bundle into uh, courses. And then it's a question of uh, kind of added value do you want to add to that? And I see that a bit like a, a freemium uh, business model that also uh, services have on the internet. And there's a free version that just is the, the course materials. And then people can pay a bit if they want a certificate because you need some administration for that. It also has value for them. So going from the open courses, you can have online courses with a certificate, and then you can increase the amount of support that you give on a course. It can be only answering questions in a forum, which costs much less than if you do live streaming sessions for an online course. If you want to do real blended learning, then they come to the classroom once in a while. Physically, that's more expensive. Or you do it fully in the classroom at the location, then it's much more expensive. So you can play with all these different settings, but the material doesn't change much. Okay, so I, I want to move on and talk about perhaps how we can create these courses and, and where we should put these courses in, in just a second. And of course, some of the tools that we can use to, to do those things. But first, I, I just want to make sure that I've understood this because this is, is somewhat of a rev revelation for me. It sounds like what you're saying is that the scarce resource is not the material. It, it's not the knowledge itself. It's the things that you add on to that. It's the stuff that you build around it. So I think there's a bit of a realization out there that we can learn a lot on the internet for free. So perhaps this isn't the scarce resource, that knowledge as such. Perhaps the scarce resource is the accountability that we can build around the uh, material that you're creating or the courses that you're supporting. Perhaps it's the location, perhaps it's the, the learning environment, but it's these add-ons that are the scarce resource. A am I on the right track here? I think that's correct, but you should also not underestimate uh, the role of the, the trainer. If the trainer has a reputation, which uh, he or she builds on uh, social media, on, on YouTube, on uh, interacting through Twitter, that also counts. There are new trainers popping up all the time on, on Twitter that produce very uh, nice materials, post them on YouTube uh, or on, on their blogs or on GitHub. And those people, they... Um, yeah, they're, they're interesting to follow. And at some point, you might want to engage with them for organizing a course together or you want to follow their courses. Do you see these people? And I think one person that we, we both think of when, when we think of someone like this is uh, Kushang Wu with, with the, the amazing stuff he's creating around Google Earth Engine. And you know, he's just doing so much work and he's doing it in public. But I see someone like Kushang Wu 
filling a completely different role th than what I do when I think about the university and that kind of very structured educational environment. Do you think there's a place for, for both these types of educators or you know, can they work together or should they be thought of as two very, very, very separate things? I think that uh, there should be a, a place at universities to, to have people like Kui Sheng and, and me uh, doing these things. Kui Sheng also works for a university. So I don't know how uh, he manages it uh, together with all his other duties at the university. For me, that's much more difficult because you have so many other tasks and uh, the master programs uh, and the, the bureaucracy around it take a lot of uh, your time. But on the other hand, universities are also for knowledge dissemination. And uh, there's a clear link between what you produce for your uh, master courses and what you do in research and in uh, our case in capacity development projects that can also be very useful for other people around the world if you post them as open educational resources. So uh, I find uh, Kuisheng in that sense very inspirational and I follow the same uh, strategy, I think, to di disseminate the materials as much as possible because that's our passion. So just before I took us on that little tangent there, and, and thank you very much for, for following me down that rabbit hole, we were about to talk about some of the, um, the, the places where we could put these courses that we're building you know, online and the tools we, we might use. So a couple of things that spring to mind for me are places like Udemy and uh, Coursera. Have you used either of those platforms or, or would you consider putting your course material there? We are investigating how we can also uh, link to uh, Coursera, be a, be a partner there and provide courses. Until now, uh, I haven't done that yet. I always uh, see that a bit as a double. I think it's very useful to have a, a course that is uh, very straightforward and that uh, a large audience can follow to have it out there because you can really attract a big audience uh, for that. On the other hand, it is a bit, little bit less compatible with what I was telling about having your open educational resources modular so you can stack them into uh, different uh, course products for different audiences. So probably it's possible to, to export uh, those modules or to, to integrate them in your own materials, but I think it's, you lose a bit of flexibility. Another issue that I see is, of course, that's branded Coursera. It's a, it's a big uh, brand, or same for Udemy. But on the other hand, universities uh, and organizations, institutions, or people themselves are a brand too. So if you go for your own brand and for my institute, then you, you would also have the ambition that your name is out there and that people would go for GIS courses in water to, uh, to my institute to follow the courses over there and not go to uh, third-party uh, providers of courses. So there are opportunities, but I also see it uh, as sometimes a bit uh, tricky to combine these different ambitions. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, there was a bit of a leading question. I, I knew we were going to end up there, but I, I appreciate you taking the time to sort of clarify that, that for the listeners. Okay, so the next very leading question. So, so what have you decided to do? So uh, what I have decided to do is to, uh, to build my own uh, platform. It's called gisopencourseware.org to uh, bundle materials that uh, I have developed because in our education, we cannot uh, offer all the nice uh, tutorials and, and videos that we have. And so I thought, let's uh, ask my organization if they want to support uh, another platform run on Moodle that we also use for our other courses. It's uh, an open source uh, learning uh, management system. Yeah, that was really uh, nice to, that they agreed with that. And uh, I have implemented a lot of uh, courses over there and it's still increasing. And the idea behind it is also that other people can contribute to that. So if you're out there, a GIS trainer, or you have blogs and you want to use Moodle with all the facilities that Moodle offers, then you can uh, implement your course over there. It's completely uh, free for the outside world. But uh, the business model behind it is that if there's... Uh, demand from the market to implement those courses for organizations or to have it like a regular online course or a short course for professionals, that we can uh, facilitate those things together. What's also interesting is that uh, these courses are translated uh, by volunteers. So we have very active people from uh, Mexico and Brazil and uh, even Japan translating these courses. I can see from the statistics that they're also used by these different uh, countries that speak those languages. And that's a really nice thing. Uh, to see happening. So I think it increases the dissemination of materials while it's not too much extra work to uh, maintain this. The only thing that I don't see really happening at this moment is real contribution from other trainers to the platform. And maybe that's a bit more difficult to achieve. Yeah, I, I can see that being a bit of a double-edged sword, right? Because they're worried about being digital sharecroppers, like building something on, some, on a piece of land that they don't necessarily own. So I, I guess I can see it. 
and perhaps for all the same reasons that we talked about before in terms of Coursera and uh, Udemy as well. I think you're right. And uh, I think the only one who has contributed really with uh, an external course to the GS Open Courser platform is Christian Wu. So also in that sense, he's a pioneer. In an earlier conversation, you talked about the, this platform that you're building. You talked about that you're building it on something called Moodle. But you, you also really stressed the importance of building in this interactivity. What tools are you using inside of your platform to build in, to add this interactivity so people aren't just watching you know, a video for three hours, but they're doing things, they're answering quizzes, they're solving problems. Could you name that tool for me, please? Yes, yeah, so in Moodle, you can use a lot of functionality from uh, Moodle, and there are a lot of plugins for Moodle. But what I really like to use is uh, H5P. It's uh, an open source technology. If you go to h5p.org, you can find lots of examples. And it enables me to do really nice uh, interactivity, such as uh, clickable uh, maps. I have an exercise where they need to click on a map and uh, point out the things that are incorrect on the map, or drag and drop interactivity, where they need to complete a flowchart. So there are all kinds of elements for a flowchart, and they need to drag them in the correct box. Or in hydrology, we have the strata ordering method. So the theory explains it, and then they need to uh, fill in the strata order numbers in the, in the river. Uh, system that they have uh, graphically in front of them by dragging those numbers to the right uh, streams. And that is really a nice interactivity that H5P enables. Another great thing is that it can create overlays on uh, YouTube videos. So if you have already a video, you can add questions in your video as an overlay that they need to answer. Yeah. So, so when you told me about this last time, I went and had a look at it and it's absolutely amazing. It integrates well with WordPress as well and I'm sure a bunch of other different platforms, but that being able to add, add overlays on videos is incredible. So drag in a video from YouTube, for example, and then you can stop at certain points and add in these little pieces of uh, interaction. It, it's amazing. So but we've got th these amazing tools that we can use. What do I, as the course creator, see on the back end? Can I see who's completed what? Can I see the perhaps the, the click-through rate? Can I see, do, do I get any statistics based on some of these interactions that my students are doing? Yes, uh, through Moodle, uh, you can see a lot of uh, statistics on the participants. Uh, I can see which of those uh, quizzes they have completed, how well they have done. Every assignment that is submitted, you can have an email sent to you that it's submitted and you can check it. Um, you can see uh, how often they have logged in. That's more for the courses that are uh, not open, but where people are registered. Because in GIS Open Course, where we uh, don't have people uh, registered, but we monitor through uh, Google Analytics who are the people uh, using that, but we don't want to take any other personal information. But once you want a certificate and all these extra experiences from the value chain, we will move you into a closed course system where you are enrolled, and then we can monitor many things. So I mentioned this right at the start, and I'm sure it's clear to the listeners by now, but you have a ton of experience you know, doing this, educating people, teaching people about GIS, teaching people about geospatial, both in person and, and online. Has this experience in these different settings, has this changed the way you approach helping people understand new things, and especially on an online environment? And I guess what I'm getting at is we live in a time with where everyone's doing a webinar and there's online presentations and there's online meetings all the time. But for me, a lot of the ones that I've attended, it looks like people have, have done the same things, right? They've taken the same PowerPoint and instead of delivering it, boring me in person, they've decided to bore me over the internet. What can we do to be better at presenting things, at, at teaching people something new? I think you need to do it uh, by design. So just having your webinar posted on, uh, on a platform is uh, not enough. Of course, you can add uh, overlays from H5P as we discussed, but it's better if you have a, a real good plan on how to design your online course based on those uh, learning objectives and then make those different elements like uh, video clips in a nice way at studio quality instead of recording your classroom sessions or if you are in a Zoom session with all kinds of other participants. I don't say that you shouldn't do that at all because we also did that um, at the beginning of um, the COVID crisis. Uh, Kurt and me, we organized a series of seven webinars based on uh, our book, QGIS for Hydrological Applications. And uh, we had a lot of participants and it was very engaging and interesting at the end of uh, each session when we had uh, the geo beers or the geo coffee or wherever they are at what time in the world. People were presenting their results and uh, it was real fun to do. So we had recorded all these uh, webinars and they are integrated in the course in those uh, closing chapters of each lesson. So as a recap, 
It was also fun because we had uh, developers from certain plugins who uh, told about the newest things in the plugin and answered questions from the audience. So I think in that sense, it can contribute. But if you record things in a classroom as a webinar, which is more hybrid, I think that you will lose a lot of uh, quality. It gets too long and boring, and you then better redesign it and uh, make shorter topics and cut it into pieces and add interactivity in between. Is there anything you do before you like r- record or perhaps uh, presenting online? Is, is, do you have a routine that you go through? Do you have certain sort of checks that you, that you do? Do you do anything to sort of get yourself in the right frame of mind to start teaching? If it's for asynchronous teaching, then of course you have enough time to prepare that uh, at home behind your computer. And you need to have a good storyline in your head. And if it's about demonstrating things in GIS, you of course need to uh, work through it uh, in a dry run and think about all the pitfalls and have make sure that all your files are uh, correctly uh, named and organized and not in private folders or things are uh, or Word documents or emails are popping up. So there are a lot of things that can add to the professionality if you want to really record in uh, studio quality. If you do a live streaming session, then of course, professionality is also important. And there are, I think, similar guidelines as uh, you have when re- you record a, a podcast. So it needs a lot of preparation. Also, if you have other people in your session that contribute, uh, you need to make uh, agreements on, uh, on muting, background noises, all kinds of things that would distract the students from the materials. But I'm, I'm a big fan of having the uh, asynchronous materials, dedicated materials that are studio quality and cut up in nice pieces, because also that increases the modularity if you want to reuse it in uh, other ways for different types of courses. So do you think that educational institutions are, are really well equipped to handle the, the fast pace of the, the changes that we see in, in technology? I think that's one of the biggest challenges that the, the lecturers need time to keep up to date with their field. And in GIS, uh, it goes very fast. Open source GIS, it goes even faster. But also institutionally, how do you keep pace with uh, a changing world in the sense of millennials? They learn from their mobile phones to watching uh, videos at any time of the day instead of uh, having the old ways we were teaching in the classroom with fixed schedules. So I think there's a lot to gain there, but uh, the speed of adaptation is uh, generally quite slow in academia, but probably uh, it needs some transition time uh, with a new generation uh, to show that there are also different ways of uh, keeping up with the speed of the world. Yeah, that that makes perfect sense. Uh, I wonder if one of the problems we need to solve there is this idea that, you know, those of us who have been through educational institutions like, like universities and spent five years there, we understand what it is to go there. But when these new ways show up, it's difficult to understand, well, if I was hiring this person, for example, what, what am I actually getting when, when someone shows up with a GitHub repository and some certificates from random sort of online courses? Do you understand what I'm saying? That you know, what, what am I getting at the end of it? What, what can it be used for? But I think if you go through university, because perhaps people like us have been through university, the university system themselves, we have a, a good understanding of, of what we're getting. Yeah, I think that has to, to change. There needs to be much more appreciation of uh, different ways of showing your skills, like on GitHub, how, how active you are. It's very tangible. A certificate doesn't say everything, but if you have software in, in, in GitHub or you engage with, uh, with people uh, on, on fora, in, uh, in social media, or if you uh, publish uh, educational materials yourself, that's, I think, much more tangible and, and has a higher impact than, than maybe just having your certificates that only prove that you probably followed some course and, and got a certificate. Do you encourage students to, to document their journey, to do work in public and sort of help people understand where, where they're going and, and how, the, how they're getting, going to get there? We don't really have much time for that in our education, but what I do is uh, during GIS courses, I show them how it works. So if they find a bug, and we, we found a bug in, in the last course, not a huge one, but what do you do then? Or if you see a translation mistake in, in the software and with open source, there are ways to get that fixed. So uh, in a course, you can follow that whole trajectory from posting the issue in, in GitHub and see how it follows up to, to fixing the problem and then probably hopefully having that within the course in a new release. When you do things like that, do you find the students really engage with that process or are they more of the mindset, this is getting in the way of the thing that we're supposed to be learning, this is a distraction, this is a rabbit hole that we shouldn't be going down, we should be concentrating on doing this analysis? Depends a bit on the, on the level of the student. So if uh, 
they are not so tech savvy, then getting them into GitHub can be a bit of a, <laughs> a big jump. But I think in general, uh, just showing them how things work and stick to the concepts and not too much to, uh, to the details, to, to the Python issues or the real error, but more to the procedure, I think it's an eye opener for many of them. And to see that live in a course is, of course, uh, fantastic. So students take these courses and I, I guess they, they have a perceived value, right? Where do they put that value? Is the value on the, on the software that they're using? This tool is important for me. Is it more important for them to understand the concepts around the things that they're doing, the analysis they're trying to carry out, or perhaps the workflow? Or is it more focused on very, very specific skills? Perhaps Python, for example. Do you see them putting more or less value on, on any one of these kinds of things? In general, the audience that I teach uh, to, they are uh, from a certain discipline related to water. So they are more interested in the workflows or they should be more interested in the, doing the workflows and replicating the process maybe with other software or to another study area. But often in the courses in the beginning of the curriculum, they still need to find their way. So I got a nice question, uh, I think it was yesterday uh, from a student like, hey, why don't you write up all these tiny steps so I can do it uh, in, in once uh, correctly? But I explained to the student that that's not the way to learn. You need these challenges are there <laughs> for a reason. So with all the material that you have, you need to solve that. Because if you move to another study area, you would have also these challenges. It can be technical challenges with reading uh, errors from software, or it can be challenges related to the study area that is maybe less suitable for certain techniques on delineating catchments of, or finding an outlet in a stream. And uh, it's very important that they go through such uh, challenges instead of having a cookbook that they can easily walk through and then super happy that they did all the steps. But in the end, you learn much less than having sometimes a challenge on the way. Yeah, I think that was a really interesting thing to say. That's not the way you learn. Do, do you think there's a difference between being educated and learning? I think that's a, there's a big difference between the two. You should not be a consumer as a, as a student or a participant of a course. And that's often the, the mentality, especially if you do a courses where people have less intrinsic motivation. They change it to consumers because they want with the least efforts to get a diploma. But in the end, the motivation for the, the teacher to teach such a topic like, like GIS and the stuff that I do is uh, that you want to see great results from your students and that they achieve those uh, learning objectives. You're much less interested in questions in the exam, uh, specific things. And that distinguishes between the two and also the, the attitude of the different participants that you have in the audience. It's funny, you, you talk about that putting in the effort, right? They just want to do perhaps if you're had the mindset of, I am here to be educated, as opposed to, I am here to learn. Maybe you're also in the mindset of, what, what's the minimum I need to do? But if we translate that to business, like, what's the minimum I need to do to have a success? What's the return on investment here? I mean, that would work quite nicely, but it, it doesn't seem to work here. It doesn't seem like a, a great sort of long-term solution in terms of our mindset when we approach learning new things or development in general. I think it uh, links back to an earlier question about yeah, the certificates. If the in incentive is just to get the certificate as quickly as possible, yeah, that is not about uh, achieving the learning objectives where you want to get the most out of a course as a participant. And if you are intrinsically motivated and you have chosen to do a course and you have checked the objectives of, of a course, then of course you should ask the trainer more and more if, it, if there's time to, to learn extra things within the time. And uh, I think that's the, the part that I like most. If we have those kind of students who ask things beyond those little cookbook steps and that you can show them, hey, I have a video on that on my YouTube channel. If you have time, you can follow that to do this and that extra. When you're teaching, when, you, when you're educating, when you're helping people learn that, that these new skills, do you see it as your role as the person in charge, as the person who's leading this, this, this learning? Is it your role to provide that motivation or to motivate people? Or do you expect the students to have that motivation with them when they come to you? I don't think it's that uh, black and white. It, uh, again, depends on the target group. But uh, if you have a mixed group, let's say people who are intrinsically motivated in GIS because they're super interested in it, and you have others that uh, are not so much interested because it was uh, not the main topic of their studies and they just have to do it, then you, in those mixed cases or in the worst case, when they're all like that, then I have to be uh, the real motivator. But you hope that through doing those quizzes and uh, making, showing some fun things, like I showed examples from the 30-day map challenge, that you can convince those people that it's fun to do GIS and that they are also capable with those skills to do similar things. So show them examples 
And what they really get enthusiastic about, and uh, Kurt uh, Menke, who also is involved in the, some of the courses that I teach, we, we also show in the end presentation of uh, the QGIS community. So it's not just software. And it's also not just all about skills, but it's also about people and how does it work and how do, can you become part of that? And that part of the, the course is what, what students really like. This is going to seem like a bit of a, a funny question, but I, I want to try anyway. Do you, do you think there's a difference between documentation and training materials? Yes, there's a huge difference. Documentation is organized in a, in a different way and not to achieve certain objectives or workflows. While education material need to be linked to certain learning objectives, ideally. There's, of course, people who mix uh, those things. But courses go beyond finding a solution for a specific tool uh, in the documentation. It's more linking up different parts of the documentation to make it into a coherent uh, storyline to follow a certain uh, workflow. So the reason why I ask that is because I think a lot of people are creating new things. They're creating new software products, for example. And I feel like they think by publishing documentation on the internet and making it publicly available, that they are also providing training, helping people understand how their product works and what it can be used for. Do you think that's a mistake? It can be. I don't think also that is black or white. If the documentation is built in such a way that you have a video clip, that it follows a certain workflow that you can do specifically with such a tool, then it is an open educational resource, I think. But most often, uh, you have a tool which has certain uh, buttons and tools, and the developer doesn't necessarily think of all the possibilities that you can do with those tools. That's the nice thing about GIS. It's this huge Lego kind of toolkit with all the building blocks, and it's up to different users to put them together into an application and to give it a purpose. And that goes far beyond just documentation, which is, should probably in most cases be only about functionality. I guess what I was thinking when I asked you that is, I wonder if there's room for educators as well or for businesses to approach this as educators. So I have a new product, I have, I have a new service, I, I have some new data and approach it as an educator, not just someone providing like a list of, of what is, is present when they download the package, but as an educator, this is the possibilities. This is the storyline that you could follow. These are some workflows and they have sort of a deeper inter interaction with people. I think that's the added value of those tools and those products. I can give you an example. We did a hackathon for FAO, for uh, Vapor on open data, and uh, one of the winning teams developed a QGIS plugin on uh, water productivity. The added value is that, uh, of course, they can explain how to install it and how it works, uh, which is a bit of a struggle at the moment. But if the people who find the, the plugin useful get trainings by them on how to use that in their day-to-day -day work, then they can add value to the tool. And that goes again beyond just the documentation. So earlier, we talked about this idea of a, of a business model. You know, how, how can we make money doing this? What role should our content play? How should we clip it up? How should we put it together in different ways? How should we position it? But with the thinking being that this is part of a, a value chain that somebody will perhaps pay money for, or hopefully pay money for. If I go to Udemy right now, for example, and I look up GIS courses, I see something like, 600, 700 results for, for GIS courses. And if I do the same thing for something like with the search term GIS Python, for example, there's 10,000 results that come back to me. Of, of course, not all of those will be relevant, but the point is here, there's a lot of content out there already. There's a lot of material out there already, and it's on very well-known platforms that people already know and understand. Is there any hope for people out there that want to do this as a business, to create content like this as a business, to teach online a as a business? I think this only confirms that you have to stand out in a certain way, and that is uh, your online presence need to be uh, clear if you have the ambition to, uh, to develop online courses for, uh, for a big uh, worldwide audience. Then also, yeah, what makes you stand out? That is uh, your professionality, the way you deal with responding to questions online, and in fact, that makes a difference. Of course, there are also at Udemy and Coursera famous uh, lecturers, people from uh, famous universities. But if you start your own business, you need to be the name. You need to give the participants the experience. And we all know our famous uh, trainers in, in our GIS world that we would like to have a class with. Uh, probably they, they are very visible uh, on the internet. Like uh, Ushafal Gandhi gives great uh, courses. He's out there. He helps out other people. The same, of course, with uh, Christian Wu, who we mentioned. I uh, hope 
people see the same uh, with uh, my work. That should make them much more eager to follow a course with us than to go to uh, to look into those thousands of other courses that are provided. Yeah, I, I think what you're getting at there is that no like and trust is is really important. We're more likely to invest in a course from someone that we, we we know already because they're a known quantity. We already understand that this person is a an expert in the field and they've shown up so many times online that we trust them, that we're prepared to give them money. So another thing about building anything that you're wanting to sell, especially online, is this idea of driving traffic to it. I know that you're active on a couple of different social media platforms. Would you just name them for us, please? I'm quite active on uh, on YouTube. I have my YouTube channel. I think I started back in 2015 with uh, producing the first videos for courses. And then I found out that uh, it got some traction and I started building on it. And now it's uh, it's quite big. There are many videos. I don't know how many, but they're around 13,000 uh, subscribers at the moment. I interact with them through the, the forum, uh, through the comments on, on YouTube. I'm also active on, on Twitter. Um, I think there are many ways to, to engage through Twitter. People ask questions, but you can also show what you do. Uh, the 30-day map challenge is a great example of that to show what, uh, what your specialty is. And in my case, of course, I like to pitch for water and environment and those kinds of things. Raster more than vector, maybe. So people can also uh, find your, your specialism within the big uh, GIS field because there's quite some diversity also there. I'm also on Instagram, and I think that has a quite of kind of different purpose that is uh, more uh, visual. And I also use that to show that there's also a person behind the profession. And in that sense, that's also nice to engage with people. There's a big group who is not on Twitter, but is a lot on uh, Instagram that you can also find there. So I, I realize all of those platforms are, are very, very different, and they serve very different purposes. And you show up probably in a different way on each one of them. In terms of your, your business model, in terms of creating awareness around the courses that you're building, the work that you're doing, if you had to choose one of those to continue with, which one would it be? I think YouTube has the, the biggest outreach. It has uh, all these subscribers. It has a lot of statistics that you can see about them. It has a community tab on your channel where you can uh, engage with them. So if Twitter or Instagram don't exist anymore, then uh, I, I think I would use that one uh, much more. On the mobile app, it even has stories where you can promote your events uh, that you have, like webinars or other things. So I think uh, YouTube is quite good. Well, I mean, I mean, thank you very much. You've been an absolute wonderful guest. I really enjoyed the conversation. I feel like we've covered a lot of ground here. And I, I want to kind of wrap things up with, with just a, a few sort of broad questions about education in, in general. So when you think about the future of education, what, what do you think about? Do you think about as we're continuing down this path of university is the way to go? Or do you see it as being, I think you've used the word modular a lot during this conversation. And to me, university doesn't seem to be modular at all. But online education is more modular. And I can also see a challenge for universities at keeping up with this never-ending cycle of technology. You know, it's, it's racing ahead. There's new things coming out. And there is a demand to sort of keep up with the new stuff, right? To keep understanding what's happening. And I think this is going to be a difficult task for universities to cope with, but I can see online being a more sort of flexible and modular environment and doing a better job of that. But I'd be curious to hear what you think when you think about the future of of education. I think these two have to go together. So universities need to make uh, space for trainers uh, who do professional courses and not have the burden too much of the the bureaucratic uh, side of uh, offering master courses, which have to be accredited, etc. For professional trainings, you don't really need that. They need to be of high quality, but they don't have to go through the whole cycle of uh, accreditation, for example. But they are very useful to develop new things, state-of-the-art, new technology, as you mentioned, and especially in the open-source GIS world, it goes very fast. With each uh, QGIS version, there are uh, nice new things that you want to include in education, which people also would like to learn, which don't necessarily need to immediately go to uh, the master's education probably within some time, uh, will go there. And if you have that then also modular, then you can easily integrate it in the master's education. I think at universities, we often work the other way around. Our baby, for good reasons, is the uh, master's education. And then as a side activity, we start uh, opening up certain of those master modules for professionals. I think uh, we can do this much uh, smarter, where we both can uh, benefit to have higher quality and more uh, state-of-the-art courses developed. Well, again, Hans, 
Thank you so much for your time. I, I really appreciated the conversation. I pre appreciate you taking the time to sort of walk me through things. Your thinking around education in general, what's working, what's not working, and especially the side about um, creating an online business through education. I think that's really interesting. It's something we don't really get to talk about, but we see it increasingly in, in a really massive scale around us. So I appreciate all that. Where can the listeners go if they want to reach out to you, if they want to ask more questions or, or just continue this conversation? Uh, well, as mentioned, they can reach me at uh, probably every uh, social media platform, I think, except uh, Facebook. Check my uh, YouTube channel and uh, you can uh, find me on LinkedIn and post questions there or uh, contact me through uh, Twitter or Instagram. Wonderful. Thanks again. Really appreciate your time. I'll put links to those places in, in the show notes of this episode so, so people can track you down. Thanks, Daniel. So I really hope you enjoyed that episode with Hans van der Klast. And I just want to take a minute here to highlight some of the tools that Hans mentioned during the conversation. Certainly, I had never heard of, of some of these before, and I think they might be useful for you. So he talked about some of the usual suspects. We had um, Zoom and, and Teams. He also mentioned something that falls into the same sort of category, and this was a, a tool called Big Blue Button. And I'll put links to all these in the show notes. He also mentioned something called Kahoot. So Kahoot is a tool, an online tool you can use to to develop and distribute quizzes. So again, like focusing on this idea of interactivity when we when we teach and educate online. In terms of hosting events, um, Hans mentioned the Wonder platform. So this is at wonder.me. And, and this is a tool from what I can gather is for hosting virtual events and inspiring people. Hans talked about making using this tool to create bubbles. And I, I guess this is this sounded to me a lot like breakout rooms in Zoom. If you want to get an idea of what Hans's courses look like and the way he's developing them, um, go along to gisopencourseware.org. That would be a good place to see it. And when you're there, remember that this is built on something called Moodle. So during the conversation, Hans talked a lot about interactivity. So trying to make learning fun for people, trying to communicate things in different ways and add interactivity wherever we can. And he mentioned something called H5P. So this is the tool feature whatever you want to call it, that he uses to add interactivity into a lot of the the courses that he's building. I've had a brief look at this and it looks amazing. It's well worth checking out. And again, you'll find all the links to these things in the show notes of this podcast episode. So I just want to highlight a few points here that I thought uh, were really interesting about this, this conversation. So the first one being, what, what is live for? What is synchronous communication for? What's the unfair advantage we have when we are live in the moment communicating in sync with each other albeit in a virtual environment what what is that for because i think if it's for interacting with each other if that's the unfair advantage we have when we are communicating in sync with each other in real time when we are sharing a moment together what why aren't we doing more of that maybe if the selling point of live is scarcity this is a moment it's happening now you are in or you are out but it will never be repeated. It will never be the same. If that's the selling point, doesn't that go away when we record it and post it online? And I think all of that magic of the live event, of being together in the room, all of those things that when it's live, it's a feature, I think a lot of those things become bugs when it turns into asynchronous communication. And I think that's the case because the magic is gone. I think it's the case because we expect a lot more of asynchronous communication. This podcast, for example, th this podcast is an asynchronous way of communicating. The selling point can never be scarcity because th there is a lot of content out there. And the selling point is not interactivity. I, I can't interact with you. You weren't there in the room when this podcast episode was being recorded. And that's why I spend hours polishing and editing each and every podcast episode that I publish. And I do this because this is the unfair advantage that asynchronous communication has. So I have the opportunity to look at the live recording and say, okay, how is this best going to serve the people that might listen to this? And all those magical bits that happen between me and the guest, those funny moments, the, the mistakes that were made, a lot of them, I, I remove them because they don't add value. They, they were only funny. They were only magical live in the moment. And I don't think they're going to be helpful to you. So those are my personal opinions on the subject. That's the way I feel. I'm not asking you to agree with me, but I am asking you to consider when it makes sense to be in sync and when it makes sense to be out of sync when we communicate online. And that's it for me. That's it for another episode of the Mapscaping Podcast. 
As always, thank you so much for, for tuning in. I really, really appreciate it. You are more than welcome to reach out to me. You can find links to places. You can, you can contact me in the show notes of this podcast episode. And I'll be back again next week with a new episode. I'll talk to you then. Bye.